ビデオ In the post war era of Japan, the fear of juvenile delinquency gripped at the heart of society. Though Japan was enjoying a robust and steadily growing economy at the time, the young working class generation felt like the conservative elites in power were leaving them in the dust. And while some would turn to leftist activism in reaction to this, many decided that it was easier to just go out and do some crimes. Throughout the late 20th century, subcultures of juvenile delinquents struck terror in the hearts of law abiding citizens and authority figures while also ingraining themselves into popular culture. Subcultures like the territorial bonchos with their tough guy image and informal code of honor, or the aggressive bosozaku who frequently disturbed the peace with their ear splitting midnight motorcycle rides. But out of all the subcultures, there was one that really filled the hearts and minds of conservative Japanese society with fear and fascination, to the point that Japanese police. Pamphlets would call them omens of downfall. They were the Sukebon. Literally translated to the phrase girl boss, the Sukebon was a violent girl gang that emerged in the late 70s as a reaction to the fact that other gangs wouldn't take on female members. The Sukebon, consisting mostly of girls from working class families, had their own hierarchies and unspoken ironclad codes of honor that they would follow to a T. Loyalty and respect were rewarded while crimes like disrespecting other members or stealing another's boyfriend were grounds for punishment. And while they mostly engaged in petty crime, many young women were drawn to the Sukebon for their strong sense of community and justice. The entire subculture was a way for marginalized Japanese women to collectively beat back the societal expectations of them to be subservient, docile marriage fodder for white collar salarymen. Around the 80s, the Sukebon had peaked at tens of thousands of members. But what really made the Sukebon stand out was their unofficial uniforms, Converse high tops, cropped loosely tied sailor blouses that hid razors and bike chains, accessories like button badges and face masks, and the long pleated skirt that was a reaction towards Japanese society's sexualization of teen girls. And while the time of the Sukebon has since passed, girl gangs still exist in Japan but have more in common with the Bosozaku of anything, their legacy is probably the most enduring out of all the late 20th century gangs, not just as romanticized street gangs or feminist icons, but as pop cultural figures. Japanese creatives had always been fascinated with the Sukebon. At their peak, the Sukebon were mainstays of violent exploitation films where producers would cast actual members of the gangs in lead parts. Not only did it give these films a veneer of authenticity, but it also helped cement the Sukebon archetype into popular culture, where they can exist as heroes, villains, comic relief, or even as just visual shorthand for a woman who can whip weaklings into shape. But the Sukebon's influence wasn't just restricted to cinema and anime. In the late 70s to mid 80s, shoujo manga had a miniature boom of titles where the main cast were either Sukebon or Sukebon adjacent. These tended to be way more action focused than the average shoujo title, with the plot mostly centered around Sukebon going to a school and fighting corruption and injustice. But out of all these titles, it was the one that actually popularized this type of story that appears to be the most well known. And while it's relatively unknown outside of Japan, it is the go to Sukebon story for most people. <laughs> Saki Yasamiya is a troublemaking delinquent currently residing in prison, I mean, sorry, reform school. One day the police offer her a chance to be freed early from her sentence, I mean semester, if she becomes an undercover detective for them in order to root out corruption in high schools. Now being a delinquent who obviously thinks that ACAB, Saki turns them down flat. The police, expecting that, decide that the best way to entice her is to give her mother, who's currently residing in death row for killing her abusive husband, a stay of execution. This forces Saki to accept because hooray for blackmail! Placed under the guidance of Officer Kiyochiro Jin and given a metal yo-yo that is simultaneously her weapon and her badge, Saki's first case is to infiltrate her former school and see if she can find any leads regarding a mysterious bus crash that might involve foul play. 
And sure enough, Saki ends up running afoul with the three most popular students and obvious suspects, the Mizuchi sisters. Emi, a fame-hungry wannabe artist, Ayumi, a rival Sukeban that moonlights as a drug dealer with surprisingly good English, This is the best. Let me see it first. Good. And Remy, who is pure evil. Saki, having a functional brainstem, knows that these three are somehow behind the case. The only question is, how can she prove that they are, and how can she nab them? Tsukiban Deka is one of those franchises that is very popular in Japan, and only Japan. Despite being a relatively long-running franchise, Tsukiban Deka's only real exposure in the States was the OVA released by ADV Films, and a live-action film that rode the incredibly brief wave of Japanese live-action exploitation cinema of the mid-2000s with the creative title of Yo-Yo Girl Cop. I guess what I'm saying is that for a medium-spanning franchise, Tsukiban Deka's presence in the States never really went beyond niche interests. And I know I'm not gonna change that, I'm just one guy on YouTube after all, but I feel like I can really show the appeal of the Tsukiban Deka franchise. And how fortunate I am to be an Anatuber because it's the aforementioned OVA that was released in 1991 that packages the premise, the story, and the overall appeal of the Tsukiban Deka franchise into a nice, neat, two-episode package. Now, the creation of Tsukiban Deka is a fun story in and of itself. How the manga got started is honestly kind of an accident. Original manga creator Shinji Wada had been in the business for six years up to that point. Unfortunately for him, he felt jinxed because all of his runs would always be cancelled or cut short. But his salvation would come in the form of a misunderstanding. In a meeting with his editors from publishing company Haku Sensha, Wada was pitching a new series that he had been developing that he had envisioned as a high school drama. However, most likely due to the amount of drinks that are usually imbibed at these types of meetings, the editors got in their mind that the manga Wada was pitching was a detective story starring a high school student. And they loved it! Wada, realizing he wasn't in the best position to correct his editors, decided to take the drama angle and the detective story angle and combine the two together. Tsukiban Deka was published in the first 1976 issue of the semi-monthly shoujo magazine, Hana Toyumi. The series would run from January 1976 to December 1982 for seven volumes. It was a consistent bestseller to the point that when Wada was able to end the comic on his own terms at the end of volume 5, he was asked to come back and make two more volumes. And of course, this was after another serial of his flop, so it's not like he had much choice in the matter. But even after the manga's end in 1982, Tsukiban Deka as a franchise continued, branching off into a hit tokusatsu series in the late 80s, and even getting a few video games around that time which were, by all accounts, total kusoge. But it's the early 90s OVA that really is the best entry point for the franchise. It covers the beginning and end of the Three Vipers arc in a concise but thrilling manner, it introduces everything you need to know about the franchise in an easy, well-paced way, and hell, it's also one of the few entries of the franchise that Wada himself had some involvement in. Now, one of the things that really stuck out at me when I first watched the OVA was how it's the most 70s looking anime ever made in the 90s. Rather than update the character designs to fit the then popular trends, character designers Masahiro Kase and Nobuteru Yuki opted to instead make the characters stay true to their manga counterparts. And this is the right call because Wada himself played with the house style of 70s shoujo manga to his advantage, such as giving the antagonist Remy a look that conjures up the ideal shoujo heroine with her regal angelic hair and her dewy, sparkling eyes. It's good ironic character design considering she is one of the evilest villains in manga. But the 70s-ness of Tsukiban Deka does not just extend to the character designs. The direction of the anime imitates the famous shoujo anime of the past, specifically the ones done by Osamu Dezaki. It's a wonder that Dezaki was nowhere near this project because it's a near-flawless replication of his trademark directing style. Not only do you have dramatic camera angles or hard-hitting scenes punctuated by a gorgeously painted shot, but you also have the classical use of intellectual montage. Whenever we have a scene of one of the Mizuchi sisters plotting, that scene ends with a cut to a hissing viper, really hammering their snake motif home. Thank you. 
This is to say nothing of the animation. Despite being a middle of the road title in terms of budget, the animation can be downright exceptional in some places. Specifically, any scenes done by animation prodigy and future production IG mainstay Hiroyuki Okiura. His scenes have a level of smooth realism that makes this OVA look downright cinematic. And of course, being an action heavy title, there are the fight scenes. These scenes are great examples of how to make exciting fight scenes on a tight budget. The choreography employs a lot of squash and stretch to make the action feel dynamic, but whenever the anime has to resort to still frames in these scenes, they are there to punctuate the rhythm of the fight, cutting rapidly to make each punch feel harder and to keep the scene's tempo. <laughs> As I stated before, the Tsukeban Deka OVA is a compressed adaptation of the manga's most well-known arc. As such, there was obviously going to be a lot of changes from the page to the screen. One change is the fact that by being restricted to two 50-minute episodes, a lot of the fat of the manga gets to be trimmed. For one thing, the anime skips the lengthy first arc where we see Saki first becoming Tsukeban Deka. While that arc does establish a lot of the stakes and general background of the manga, you don't really need to devote an entire episode where Saki escapes from reform school, disguises herself as a transfer student, and solves an embezzlement case to establish why Saki is so badass. All you need is a Robocop-style entrance where Saki saves her friend Junko from some would-be rapists. Such a pity she didn't yo-yo one of their balls off. This leads into another change where the OVA is a lot more action-focused than the manga, but at the expense of focusing more on the Sukeban over the Deka. For a Sukuban detective, Saki does very little investigating in this anime. In the manga, we see her utilizing her wits more than we see her utilizing her fists. She does things like gather clues, examine evidence, and do undercover work to coax information out of suspects. Here, it seems like the only real detective work she does is allowing herself to stay in jail just so she can observe what kind of moves the Mizuchi sisters make in her absence. Which admittedly does work, but those same movements will have some contrived consequences against Saki that we'll have to get into later. As for the characters, it's a mixed bag on how they are portrayed. Saki is still relatively the same, hardened streetwise badass with a hidden caring center. The character of Junko, Saki's best friend, is also unchanged. The meek, unassuming artist who lives in poverty, but still strives to do her best and use her gift of painting to escape her situation. And her role to get murdered to serve as Saki's motivation to fully get focused on taking down the Mizuji sisters is also completely unchanged. Women in refrigerators is not just for men's character development anymore. But I feel like this plot point was done better in the manga. While the manga does lay it on thick with how the Mizushi sisters torment Junko, threatening her mentor and resigning, stealing her entire art collection for Emi to claim as her own, making her homeless, crippling her drawing hand, murdering her sickly mother via a box of snakes, and having her witness Emi win the art exhibition using a copy of the painting she made and no one believing her when she says that it is hers, it's all a means so that when Ayumi finally murders Junko, she can make it look like a suicide. With the only one who notices the discrepancies being, of course, Saki. The OVA, however, handles this plot point in a far more exploitative fashion by having Junko get kidnapped, drugged, and tortured by Remy's goons for a week before finally being unceremoniously killed. And all this happening while Saki is allowing herself to stay in jail for a week. Smooth move, Sherlock. But if there's one character that the anime excels at portraying, is them making Remy Mizuchi just utterly vile and it's all in the direction. In the manga, they say she's the evilest Mizuji sister, but in the anime, you feel that. Every scene she's in is just filled with this dark aura that radiates from the TV screen.
and it helps that of the three sisters, she has the least screen time, making it so that whenever she does show, you know some serious shit's about to go down. One of my favorite examples being this scene where the Mizuchi sisters and their father are bragging about their evil plan with each other, and occasionally it'll cut back to Remy in a completely separate location, just silently and evilly contemplating to herself. She barely says a word in this entire scene, and you can just tell that compared to her family, she is in another league of villainy. That being said, they do change some aspects of her character. One positive change is removing some genuinely harmful lesbophobic elements of her character, implying that her being canonically a lesbian is a symptom of her overall insanity, and that Remy's ultimate goal in life is to become headmistress of the school so that she can spend the rest of her life preying on underage high school tail. Yeah, the OVA decided to opt for a less offensive world domination motive instead. But a change I don't like is the anime deciding to pull a Junko Inoshima on Remy. A reason why Remy is such a threat is because she has hundreds of loyal followers at her beck and call. In the manga, they use this as an example of her charisma and having the implicit energy of a cult leader. But in the anime, bah, just make it hypnotism. Am I forgetting anyone? <laughs> God, this bitch. Meet Sanpei, the comic relief of Sukebondeka, which is ironic because I find his presence neither comedic nor relieving. His deal is that he has a major crush on Saki, and like a dog with a bone, he will not stop until Saki returns his feelings. Saki, who only keeps him around because he's good with computers, is less than interested. <laughs> Now, Sanpei was handled way better in the manga. There, he actually has a good reason for why he follows Saki around like a lost horny puppy, and it was because Saki helped clear his name when he was accused of molesting a girl on the bus. And the relationship was more based on Sanpei wanting to be Saki's underling than boyfriends. It's only near the tail end of the manga where he undergoes character development and starts transitioning out of being comic relief that he realizes that he has legit romantic feelings for her. But here, they decide to merge the early comic relief with the later romantic elements into one character, and the results are... awkward. <laughs> Saki, run. But I think what ultimately made me really dig Sukebanteka was its timeless and always welcome theme of rich people are awful and deserve to be hated. Every character who has a good moral alignment are members of the working class or just common people in general, while every evil person in this anime are just filthy rich bastards. The Mizuchi sisters themselves each represent the evil desires of the ruling class. Emi wants fame but has neither the talent nor the drive to get to it, so she just steals the labor from more talented people below her station and takes all the credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> Ayumi wants money. Despite being born into a rich family, she is completely unsatisfied with that and just wants her own hoard of riches. And what better way to do that by engaging in crime that exploits the lower classes, from petty extortion to flooding the streets with illegal narcotics. <laughs> Finally, Remy wants power. She desires no material things, but only desires to have the whole world placed firmly under her thumb. She is a sociopath who wants complete and utter control of her surroundings, to the point where she murders her entire family just to save her own skin. So,
but the Eat the Rich themes do not stop there. There's also the theme of how the upper class corrupts institutions that are supposed to help everyone, like the law and education. The reason why the Mizuji sisters were behind the bus crash was so their own father could use the crisis to gain power and have the school admit the kids of powerful politicians and businessmen, thus gaining him so many very important connections. <laughs> And they are able to do this by greasing the palms of the school superintendents to accept these new students and law enforcement officials to turn the other way if they ever suspect foul play. The corruption is also shown in the form of these rich students, who are all spoiled children who have no reason to try hard in school because their parents are rich and have ensured that they will put them on the path of luxury regardless of how many F's they get in school. And that's where Saki comes in, the working class hero who blows in from out of town to root out the corruption of the bourgeoisie, exposing them for the hollow frauds they are. Armed with nothing but a yo-yo and her wits, she fights for the lower classes who have been victimized by the cruel, unfeeling people who rule over them. Saki Asamiya is the true embodiment of the working woman's ethos of the Sukeban. Does this make Sukeban Deka a leftist anime? Mm, not really. Well, it does collectively tell the rich to stick it where the sun don't shine, and Saki makes it very clear she has zero trust in law enforcement, Suke Von Deka does shy away from making a lot more sweeping statements about law enforcement and the education system. The corruption of both of these institutions aren't seen as an inevitable result of a failed system, but more as a result of a few bad apples. This is shown by having the two authority figures we see the most from these institutions be incredibly reasonable and people who truly believe in their cause. Jean, Saki's mentor in the police department, and Mr. Numa, Saki's teacher. Because these characters exist, the message in general is that law enforcement and teachers have the best intentions, and any bad action on their behalf is just because some guy in the back is pulling the strings. And also because Saki needs some authority figures that she can at least begrudgingly respect. She may be a bad girl, but she still needs to be a good girl and respect her elders. But regardless, Tsukuban Deka is just entertainingly cathartic in the right ways. Even with certain elements I could very much do without, I enjoyed this anime for what it was. It's a good example of just how to tell a complete story of a multi-volume manga in just two episodes. Trim the fat, take advantage of your medium, and make sure you use the most of an entertaining arc. The franchise isn't perfect by any means, but Sukeban Deka does deserve to be more well known outside of Japan. And how fortunate it is to have a good solid OVA be the perfect jumping on point for such a cool franchise. Shit, I'm a machine,